things to, to be said about this problem. One is that it is so easy to solve and find a solution, a feasible solution. Very easy to find a feasible solution. In fact, a uh, elementary school kid which knows some math can do it. It is very difficult to find the optimal solution if you approach it by regular simplex method uh, techniques. But it is also very nice and smart intelligent solutions for this problem that make it easy to solve. Nothing is, of course, is easy when I say easy. But it is a straightforward. If you practice with it, you can easily do it. And almost everything in the solution process makes sense. So we will approach it uh, first by saying what is the official formulation of the problem. Then we will look at the solution procedures. So let's take a case of two. I think I, we did that last time. Two and three. So these are the supplies. Let's make up some numbers. Miss Maya, 500 is good. <laughs> well, too high, we're going to make it smaller. Let's do 150. 150. Well, I meant like and that. they say, <laughs> oh, reduce it by 100. Okay, that's 100 and the other one's 50. Oh, okay. Sure, sure, sure. Wow. And they say we don't listen to this, student. Okay. So, uh, and, and these demands, and these demands, we are going to have some numbers. Mr. Shear, could you give me some numbers? 25. 25. 75. 75 and? 50. And 50. Okay. This is called a balanced transportation problem. We have as much demand as we have this. So right now we are going to talk about unbalanced problem. What happens with the unbalanced problems? So if these problems so unbalanced, what happens is supplies is larger than demand. OK, so what if supplies are more than demands? There will be leftover units or materials at the warehouse, right? Mm-hmm. What do you do with them? Sell them, place. We sell, them, sell them to somebody else. Sell them in the free market or whatever it is. Okay? Sometimes you go to these surplus places. That's where those things come from. Okay? You, you, make, you make additional supplies. So, for example, if this one was 100 and you had 200 and 150 demand, you will create. You will create a center in here. You call it dummy supply. Okay. You call it dummy uh, demand center, and you send that additional in there. So that's why it really doesn't make that much of a difference when you are approaching the balance and unbalanced problem. What is sorry? What is what, what if the demands were more than that? You're short in here. What do you need to do? 
your stores are calling for the products, you don't have them in warehouses. You buy them from somebody else, send them in. You cannot just say we don't have. So you create another dummy warehouse to deal to to fill the additional places, the, the additional demands as we are talking about. So we are assuming that every warehouse or supply center can send to all demand centers, can supply them. The amount that we are sending is represented by XIJ. 50 units, 200 boxes, three trucks, whatever it is that you are sending. It's represented by XIJ. So XIJ will move over this. So if XIJ is zero, it means I'm not going to send anything from I to J. If XIJ is 20, then XIJ means I'm sending 20 units from I, from this center to that. I's are for this, J's are for this. In this case, my I is 2, my J is 3. Associated with this decision, there is always cost. So CIJ is representing the cost of shipping. Cost of transferring. XI units. It's per units. So if you are sending 20 and the cost is $5 per each, it's 5 times 20. That's how much cost will be of sending 20 units from I to J. And then your idea is, of course, it's very easy. You can fill the requirements in an easy fashion, elementary school fashion. But also, you can do a scientific approach to this and say, well, this is a minimization problem, and I'm trying to minimize the total cost. And the total cost, as we wrote it last time, I'm going to write it in a, uh, in a form. Z will be equal to summation, summation, I, J, C, I, J, X, I, J. And it is subject to a set of constraints. And what are the constraints? There are two sets of constraints. One is that each supply center cannot send more than what it has. And each demand center needs to be satisfied. So this one will not be getting more than 25 will not be getting less than 25. So when we are dealing with a balanced problem, it will be getting 25. This one will be getting 50. That 50 can come from either this or this, or part from that, part from this. That's transportation problem. And the way that we write them is just by looking at this. First of all, the supply constraints. 
This cannot send more than what it has. And what is it sending? It is sending x11 plus x12 plus x13. This is as much as it is sending. It's sending x from 1 to 1, from 1 to 2, from 1 to 3. And that is equal to 100. And then the second one, it would be x21, x22, x23 equals 50. What are these restrictions called? Supply restrictions. You have another set of restrictions which deals with the demands. And that is, whatever is coming to one, it may come from one, or it may come from two, but it is coming to one. That has to be equal to 25. If I'm writing for this, it is coming either from one or it's coming from two, but it is coming to two. And that has to be equal 75. And for this one, it may come from 1, or it may well come from 2. But it is coming to 3. And that has to be equal 50. Because these are goods, materials, trucks, something physical that exists or even electricity which is being transferred, the amount of the electricity you're transferring and so on. All these xij's are greater than or equal to zero. These sets will allow these numbers to make sense. So let's write that number for this problem by giving you a little list of um, CIJs. Let's say seven dollars, these are dollars per unit. Seven dollars, eight dollars, four dollars, nine dollars, five dollars, and six dollars. One, two, one, two, three. What does five mean in here? So it's referring to the cost that it is going this way. So these are what the meanings are. And then if I want to expand this and write this, it would be 7x11 plus 8 x12 plus 4x13 plus 6x21 plus 5x22 plus 9x23. That's what that is. So when I solve this problem, it would give me the best possible answer. Of course, I can. This is a very small problem. I can put these things in in Lindo or Lips or whatever it is, and get a solution. Amp use ample, uh, whatever it is, I can see the solution. If I am a a real hardcore OR. I can put this thing in a Tableau format, 
they require one, two, three, four, five artificial variables. You do big M or two phase until you find a feasible solution. From that point, you continue with solving the problem until you solve the problem. How many variables do I have in this problem? Two times three, there are six variables. How many constraints would I have? Two plus three is five. So the numbers and all those things are straightforward. So for example, for the, um, for this uh, example that we made, um, a company has, uh, for example, a company has uh, six warehouses here and 40 stores. Six warehouses, 40 stores. How many constraints we are talking about? 46. 46 constraints we are talking about. How many variables we are talking about? 46. Six times? 40. That's 240 variables. So as problems get to the real size problems, and that's only for small center like this, a store like Walmart or Kmart or Sears, JCPenney, all those things have a much, much, much larger uh, form because they are national and they are not working in the small town um, concepts or small cities. So. So this is, this is what we are looking at the problem as a general. As I said, if you want to set it up like a regular simplex method, it's a very long process. However, if you approach it like many other problems in OR, many, many applied problems in OR, do not use a straightforward simplex method to solve them. They use simplex somewhere in between, but not from the get-go. They, they, do, they do some smart thinking into the problem. And again, this is a very simple problem. If you give it to any elementary school kid that knows how to add and subtract numbers, they can do this. Okay, they can do this. Give them two bowls of chocolate, whatever, candies, and and three friends sitting there and say, "Oh, give him five, give him three, give him two. And they start picking up from the first bowl. They give it to them until the bowl is gone. Then they pick up from the second bowl and give it to the people until it's done. And that's what can be done. That's what has been done for years. So you can start here and send 25 here. You still have 75. You send 75 here. You no longer have anything in here. These two are satisfied. You come here. And say, I have 50, and this one needs 50. Send 50. This is a feasible solution. Um. When they tell you to give the solution, this is what you start with. It's 1225, and then you say, is this a good solution? Who knows? This could be the best solution, but I have no way of knowing it. And then you say, what well, that solution is a feasible solution. It's a feasible? Is it a feasible solution? How do I know it's a feasible solution? It satisfies the constraint. 
You plug him back in here. <laughs> Left hand side and right hand side match the sign that it is in between. You can test them. Let's test one of them. X11 plus X21. X11 plus X21. 25 plus 0 is 25. That's what feasibility means. Feasibility doesn't mean that, oh, it can pick 200 pounds. Feasibility means plug back into constraints. Does it match? Check the special constraint. Does it match? It's feasible solution. Remember, if you did this with big M or two face, you need one, two, three, four, five, five artificial variables, at least five, four, five tableaus to get to a feasible solution. And it is that easy to get a feasible solution. And he said, okay, well, one of my problems is gone, finding a feasible solution. How good is this feasible solution? He said, well, well, let's think about it. In driving this feasible solution, did I ever considered the cost? <gasps> Absolutely not. They say, oh, maybe this is not such a good idea. Because I'm looking at this cost, and this is only four going from one to three. It's four dollar per unit. And am I sending anything from one to three? No. Nothing. So that's not such a smart idea. Start with this. Instead of sending from the top, I go with the minimum cost. I look at this table and I said, I'll go with the minimum cost. And the minimum cost in here is four. Let me spend as much as I can there. <laughs> so the higher school solution is what? X, I start not from the top. I start from where it is. What is that? I'll go 8. Equals 50. Equals 50. 50? Yes. And we stop right there. Okay. Do we have to put Z first? X2. Now, let's just start from here. No, no, no. All right, so we can say that X23 is zero. Uh-huh. So we can say X23 is zero because that three is satisfied. So I'm basically done with that and done with that. Yeah. Then what is, what is left? You look in here and say... Five, five six, seven, eight. You go go with five, five, six, seven, eight. You go with the five. Yeah. What is five? X... Two, two. X, two, two. Yeah. X, two, two, we can send 50. Yes. So, X, one, two. We'll have to send 25. So X2250, X2250, this is gone. How much is left here? 50 is left here. Why? Because I've already sent 50 in here. 
So now I'm sending 50 in here, so I have 25 still to satisfy. So what do I do? There's only the order. The order. Two is also satisfied. I can't send anything from two. There are two left. So we do x11 25 and x12 25. Why did I write them in this order? Because it didn't make any difference, did it? They were the only two left. Why did I write them in this order? in here and said between 7 and 8, 7 is the lower number. So I'm sending that in there. So it's a very easy process to follow. But you have to follow the process. Now with these five numbers and six numbers, it is easy to see that we can manage it visually. When they are larger, we need additional tools. And that additional tool comes in terms of a transportation table. So this is what a transportation table looks like. So they do a transportation table. And this transportation table would look like this. Just like that cost thingy that we did, this becomes a transportation table. So everything is distilled into this. That's the general form of a transportation table. And then at the corners of this, we have a little box. Inside those little boxes, which are fixed, they will put the costs. So let's do a three. So what does that mean? What does that nine mean? What does that nine mean? It means the cost of transportation from supply center two to demand center five is nine dollar per unit. That's what it means. In here, in here, we will write the <coughs> supplies. And in here, we would write the demands. So we can start, make up some numbers. One hundred, two hundred, three hundred. So that is also three hundred. <clears throat> the total is three hundred. We call this problem A a balanced transportation problem. And that's a transportation table. In here, in these boxes, are the values of XIJs. 
So when I write something in here, when I write something in here, it means I'm sending from supply center one to demand center three. And the way that I do it is that as I make a decision to send something from somewhere, if I put a number in here, I'm going to reduce that number from this, and I'm going to reduce that number from this, northwest corner. basic feasible solution found by northwest corner. Where is the northwest corner when you look at this? Northwest corner. So three, two, so we start from here. So we start from here. and start assigning values. How much can I assign? 20. Where do we get 20? Because 30 minus 50 is 20. Decision in here depends on that and depends on this. The most that I can send is what they can receive, or the most that I can send is how much I have. So it's the minimum of those two. So I can assign 20 in here. I think I have a different color. So I'll send 20 in here, and then I need to do, to act. I need to reduce that to 0 and reduce that to 20. Then what? I'm still sending from the first supply. OK, northwest, northwest corner. I'm still sending from the first one. So this is satisfied. And to make sure that I'm not coming back to this, don't get mixed up, I'm going to draw a little line over this and say, gone. Okay. So I'm coming here now, and I'm looking at that 20 and this 80. And I can assign only 20. That becomes 0. And if it becomes 0, I will get rid of that whole thing, because it doesn't have any more to send anywhere. 20 reduced 60. <clears throat> Sixty and sixty. So we do sixty, and then you're faced with dilemma. This or this or both. It has to be both. You cannot eliminate both of them at the same time. Remember, sometimes you solve a simplex and some of your basic variables are zero? That's the case. And if you eliminate them, you will be short with the number of basic variables. So you are going to make a selection, row or column. 
we go with the real Justin. Bro. Bro, we are going to eliminate this. And write a note and say, why are we eliminating this? And not that. And you say, we made a choice. Arbitrary. Arbitrary. That's the ruling OR. Tiebreakers always arbitrary. So what do we do with that? Zero. Now guess what? That is gone. We need to drop to the next row. That is gone. We need to drop to the next row. What is the minimum between 0 and 100? Zero. So we are going to assign zero here. The difference between that zero and this zero, there is a zero in there. Why is there a zero in there? Because that one is non-basic. This one is basic and zero. Okay, so that zero will take care of And that would remain as 100. Now continue there. 50 and 100. 50. That's to zero. This is eliminated. That to 50. Next one, 50 and 50, 50 and 50. This goes to 0, that goes to 0. And then you're faced with another dilemma. Jasmine, let's get rid of the column. OK, so we're going to get rid of that. No, the 50 is there. These are the assignments. Okay? And you can actually, it's a, it's a good process to start writing them as you go along. Okay? So you can say x11 equal 20, x12 equal 20, x13, 4, 5, 6, 7, 0. And then when you assign this, you can say x21 is 0, 22 is 60. 2, 3, 2, 4, 2, 5, 2, 6, 2, 7, 0. And so on as you go through this process. So now this is gone. We go to this, which is this one. Notice that it is moving like this. It's, it's going like this. Step, step form, step form. That comes down, comes, goes, whatever it is. Now. Now we are at this. 30 and 0. So a 0 is assigned here. And as such, this will go away. 0 has no impact on this, so it stays at 30. That row is done, so I come down. This row now needs to be taken care of. So if you're going to column, if you erase a column, you go to the next column. You erase a row, you go to the row below. Between 70 and 30, it is 30. This will go away as it becomes 0, and this becomes 40. Column gone, next column. In this column, in this column, this is where I need to make assignment. 30 and 40, a 30, 10, 
And that's the assignment. The column is gone. Now when you get to the last column or last row, the assignment is very simple. But anyway, we are right here. 10 left in here and 30 left here. And that's what you do. Oops, sorry. Okay. And you go 0, and you go 0, and you go 30, and you go, and you go 0. And then you write your solution. And the solution will be x11 equal 20, x12 equal 20, x2 um, 2 equal 60, x3 uh, 2 equal 0, x3 um, 3 equal 50, x3 4 equal 50, x3 5 equal uh, 0, x uh, 4, 5, 30. x uh, 5, 5 is 30, x 5, 6 is 10, x 1, 2, 3, 4, okay? 5, 6, and 7. So x 4, 5, x 6, x 7, is 10 and x and x 5 7 x 5 is um, 30 and then you can just be generous and say all other Like this, are the um, axes labeled? No. Well, supply and demand, yeah. On, 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 on a table like this, are they? The axes labeled like one, two, three, four, five. In here? Yeah, just kind of. Yeah, why not? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Anything that will help you is is good. In fact, it's a very good idea. Maybe boxes are not good. Triangle. One, two, three, four, five, Six, seven. This is Northwest Corner Solution Procedure. 2150.